When you're a kid, your Christmas gift must be the hottest toy of the year, the one that's advertised day and night. Every Christmas has its own hot toy, and the phenomenon stretches back decades. Let's unwrap the most popular Christmas toy on the year you were born. In late 2000, Razor scooters proved to be the must-have toy of the early aughts. And what was the appeal of this two-wheeled thrill ride? Well, as it says on the official Razor website, the Razor scooter instantly captured our imagination and catapulted the scooter into a global phenomenon. Parents love it because there is no assembly required, and kids love that it comes in a variety of colors. Razor scooters were brought to you by Razor USA, a company founded by Carlton Calvin, who already had some major experience in the toy biz. He also marketed fetish delights like fingerboards and the once ubiquitous milk caps game, Pogs. Calvin estimated that Razor sold 5 million scooters for Christmas in the year 2000. But since the company only held a 50% share of the scooter market, that means as many as 10 million kids wound up getting a scooter that year. Who remembers the Furby, a toy that was once the hottest ticket in town? What's that? Wake up. It's my Furby. Furby loves oh. lavender. Tickle me. This electronic pet was covered in fur and looked a lot like Gizmo from Gremlins. <laughs> more Furbies, more fun. The toy even came with a backstory. The creatures were supposed to be adorable aliens who were only fluent in their native language of furbish. At first, they speak nothing but this seemingly nonsensical language. But as kids spend more time with them, the Furby starts to speak their language. Oh, oh, me. me, Amanda. Me, 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 Amanda. That's Furby. Oh, <laughs> Despite those huge bulbous eyes and all that fur, the toy originally retailed for only $35. But after the product launch in 1998, prices shot upwards of $100 in secondary markets. The demand was insane. By Christmas of 1998, Tiger Electronics had sold about 1.8 million Furbies, and the fad only got bigger and furrier from there. By the end of 1999, an astounding 27 million kids were teaching language skills to these little guys. A decade before every single person on the planet became addicted to their smartphones, American kids got an early taste of pocket tech thanks to Tamagotchi, an imported Japanese toy from Bandai. Slightly larger than a golf ball, this virtual pet required owners to tend to their every need and to regularly feed them with the push of a button. The $15 gadget was the must-have hot new toy of 1997, and stores quickly sold out of this endlessly needy technology. What about this one? Okay, this one's misbehaving, so it needs to be disciplined. Yeah, I'll handle this. I was tough but fair. Sesame Street was never intended to be a cash cow, so the crazy demand for Tickle Me Elmo dolls must have caught toy store owners completely by surprise back in 1996. The doll was, of course, based on the red, furry, childlike Muppet named Elmo, an almost frustratingly cute creature that's prominently featured on Sesame Street. Upon its release, Tyco Toys Tickle Me Elmo doll cost just under $30, quite a reasonable price considering that the fuzzy, perpetually frazzled creation laughed and quaked upon receiving its titular tickle. When your child tickles him, he talks, <laughs> laughs, and his whole body shakes. Oh, In July of 1996, Tyco was expecting to sell 400,000 Tickle Me Elmo dolls, but when they realized how quickly the dolls were getting snatched up, the company ramped up production, hoping to ship a million Tickle Me Elmo dolls to toy stores in time for Christmas. But that still wasn't enough to satisfy demand. Stores kept running out of Tickle Me Elmo dolls just as quickly as they received shipments. Well, the dolls may have been in short supply, but there was no scarcity of enterprising scalpers on the make. It's a real Tickle Me Elmo, right here, it's in the box, brand new, 200, or we can talk about it. Meanwhile, frantic parents lined up for hours, muscling each other out of the way to grab one of these must-have Christmas treasures. Parents become desperate. We hear desperation in their voice, like, where can I get it? Well, I don't know where you can get it. Move on, choose something else. By the start of the new millennium, it was well established that a Pixar movie was a bona fide cultural event. The studio could be relied upon to release a critically acclaimed film every year or so, and it would be an animated spectacular that both kids and parents would enjoy, alongside a handful of tie-in toys. Shops were woefully unprepared in 1995, when the very first full-length Pixar movie Toy Story premiered. At that point, Pixar wasn't a major force in the market, so retailers didn't stock up on enough of the tie-in merchandise. To infinity and beyond. 
not a flying toy. Get your Buzz Lightyear action figure and save the galaxy near you, Buzz Lightyear! They certainly didn't have enough real-life figures of Buzz Lightyear lining the shelves. A manic frenzy for Toy Story toys developed between the film's release on November 22, 1995 and Christmas Day. Parents snatched up whatever was available, leaving plenty of desperate shoppers in the dust. The drama even inspired a clever in-joke from 1999's Toy Story 2. And this is the Buzz Lightyear aisle! Back in 1995, short-sighted retailers did not order enough dolls to meet demand! Action figure lines had been hit or miss since G.I. Joe and Masters of the Universe dominated the toy aisle in the mid-1980s. It took an action-packed TV show to bring on a real resurgence, and that series was Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. The show followed a group of teenage martial arts experts who wore colorful masks and jumpsuits, using their skills to defeat a bunch of bad guys from outer space. Easily identifiable characters, weapons, robots, the show had everything kids liked. After the show debuted in late 1993, Power Rangers Fever officially took hold in 1994. By Christmas of that year, toy stores couldn't keep merchandise in stock. Aw, oh, these guys are pushovers! In an effort to fend off predatory toy dealers, some shops resorted to making customers ask for the toys or limiting sales. Merchandise even sold on QVC. In fact, a Power Rangers toy event moved $1.9 million worth of product in two hours. As Christmas loomed, manufacturer Bandai fielded 700 phone calls a week from frantic parents looking for stores that might still have these guys in stock. The first Home Alone film was a massive hit at the box office in 1990. People simply couldn't get enough of little Kevin McAllister, played by a young Macaulay Culkin. The film had all the trimmings of a Christmas classic in the making, only with slapstick cruelty filling in for the Yuletide cheer. Young Kevin burned the burglars' hands with flaming hot doorknobs and smashed their faces with plummeting irons and flying paint cans. Well, if Home Alone popularized good-natured sadism, Home Alone 2 popularized personal voice recorders for kids. In the second film, Kevin gets separated from his family in New York, and at one point in the story, he uses a device called a talkboy to slow down and deepen his voice. Plaza Hotel Reservations, may I help you? How do you do? This is Peter McAllister. The father. Yes, sir. I'd like a hotel room, please. Yeah. Before the film's release in 1992, the talk boy wasn't on store shelves. It was just a prop built for the movie, but it was also super slick product placement. On the same day of the movie's release, the talk boy was put on toy shelves. Demand for this toy was so high that Tiger Electronics manufactured the talk boy for years to come, making sure stores around the country were well stocked with the deluxe version of the gadget in time for Christmas 1993. Hi kids, we're home early. Hi kids, we're home early. Nevertheless, lots of retailers still sold out of the device, which presumably made plenty of kids do this. As the story goes, a Danish fisherman and woodworker named Thomas Dam invented troll dolls back in 1959 because he couldn't afford a store-bought toy to give his daughter for her birthday. Instead, he decided to make a toy of his very own, inspired by his own imagination and the forest-dwelling, luck-bringing trolls of Nordic legend. Her treasured toy reportedly caught the eye of a Danish toy store owner, who prompted Dam to form a company and sell his creepy creations throughout the world. About a million of his troll dolls were purchased in the U.S. in 1964. Then, in the 90s, these little fellows found themselves back in style again. Can't stop hugging the troll kid. Can't stop hugging the troll kid. The popularity of troll dolls surged in America in 1992, when retro toys were hot, hot, hot for Christmas. In fact, troll dolls were far and away the most popular old-school toy that year, with their wide grins and that wild shock of colorful hair coming at you in several sizes and from several different manufacturers. Believe it or not, Americans reportedly snatched up about $1 billion worth of troll dolls back in the early 90s. For the fourth Christmas in five years, the number one thing on kids' Christmas lists happened to be a Nintendo product. This time, it was the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, which at that point was the video game maker's latest and greatest home console. In North America, the system originally retailed for $199, twice the price of the NES from a couple of years before, but the graphics promised to be twice as good, as this was a 16-bit system as opposed to the 8-bit system of the NES. 
When it first hit stores in the summer of 91, only a handful of games were available. This included the bundled Super Mario World, while games like Pilot Wings and F-Zero could be purchased in stores. Nintendo anticipated selling at least 2 million SNES consoles by the time Christmas had come and gone. Ultimately, Nintendo sold over 23 million systems all told. Ah yes, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Those heroes in a half shell turned out to be an unlikely success story, which began as an underground comic book back in 1984. That's where we first met this quartet of mutated reptiles named after Renaissance artists. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles live in a sewer, eat pizza, and train in the martial arts under a rat sensei named Splinter. By 1987, a popular animated TV series was on the air. In 1990, the first live-action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie hit the big screen, earning over $200 million at the box office. Action figure versions of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were readily available in the late 80s, but sales absolutely exploded after the film. More than 300 products hit toy stores in time for Christmas. The Game Boy was an innovative, portable video game system that proved to be a huge success for Nintendo. This wasn't exactly the newer, better, faster version of the Nintendo Entertainment System. Instead, it was marketed as a device that offered all the joys of the NES, but in the form of a battery-powered, pocket-sized device. It's portable, it's in stereo, and its games are interchangeable. Thanks to the device's 2-inch green-colored screen, gamers could leave their bedrooms and rec rooms and bring the Game Boy everywhere, along with addictive games like Tetris, which came bundled with the system. Portable consoles became a profitable alternative to traditional gaming for Nintendo, and it led to later devices like the Game Boy Advance and the 3DS. All told, Nintendo sold over 118 million of the original Game Boy, but it wasn't their first success. In 1985, Nintendo launched a brand new entertainment system that offered eye-popping graphics and sound, at least for the time. Sales of the Nintendo Entertainment System started picking up significantly in North America when the company offered the product in different bundles. The original basic set included nothing but the console, but later versions included a single game, like Super Mario Bros. In 1988, this was followed by the more expensive action set, which included the NES Zapper. Oh, and we should probably mention the short-lived accessory, Rob the Robot. Are you ready? Is your family ready for the incredible Nintendo Entertainment System? Are you ready for Rob, the extraordinary video robot? The NES was a retail phenomenon, selling 10 million copies by the beginning of the 1988 holiday shopping season. By the time Christmas came and went, another 7 million customers had purchased one. In the 1980s, an engineer named Ken Forsey added some cutting-edge technology to a toy as old and classic as they come, the teddy bear. The result was Teddy Ruxpin, the first commercially available toy to feature animatronics. I failed again. How about these, Master? Hi there, my name is Teddy Ruxpin. Teddy was outfitted with a cassette deck where kids placed one of many tapes full of magical stories, and then Teddy told his tall tales to excited little kids. His lips and eyes moved like the friendliest, furriest robot on the storytelling scene. The toy hit stores in late 1985, just before a terrifying Saturday morning special aired on ABC. Golly, she is a real wood sprite. No bigger than a bird, and very pretty. Well, how about moving this big? Oh! Teddy Ruxpins became increasingly popular throughout 1986. By Christmas, it was one of the most sought-after toys in the country. $93 million worth of Teddy Ruxpin dolls had been sold after being in stores for just one year. More than 20 years before it was a billion-dollar movie franchise that launched Shia LaBeouf and Megan Fox to superstardom, the Transformers were a line of toy robots that, with just a few turns and clicks, transformed into cars, trucks, and various other snappy disguises. Introducing Blaster. He looks like an innocent radio, but transformed is the powerful Autobot communicator. Launched in late 1984 alongside the animated Transformers series, their popularity reached a fever pitch in 1985, generating $333 million in revenue that year, a quarter of all of Hasbro's sales. Cabbage Patch Kids certainly weren't the first soft, squeezable dolls with interchangeable outfits, but several marketing gimmicks helped to make them an extremely hot commodity. Wow! I'm bouncing up and down! These dolls clearly weren't your average, faceless, mass-produced toys. They even came with adoption papers to make their new owner feel more like a parent. And the ads, fully grown adults, perhaps got a little too excited about this fact, since they presumably had real kids of their own. 
They're here! Look, genuine adoption papers and birth certificates. You can even get a birthday card. The problem with turning out one special doll after another? Each Cabbage Patch Kid took a lot of time to make, and parent company Coleco simply couldn't churn them out fast enough to meet demand. The dolls became massively popular throughout 1983, leading to total madness during the holiday shopping season. Dolls sold for twice their label price, parents attacked each other at toy stores, and other parents camped out in shop parking lots in order to meet incoming shipments. Where is she? Do you I agree? Her? Is that I what Christmas is about? That's I agree with you 100%. A full-grown woman taking a doll out of a child's hand? <laughs> the fad certainly didn't subside in 1984, but Coleco managed to get ahead of the curve, increasing production well before the holiday season. But the dolls remained hard to get, with thousands of parents on waiting lists by Christmas 1984. Many of them didn't receive their dolls well into 1985. By then, distributor Coleco was enjoying sales of $776 million, and the vast majority of that money was thanks to Cabbage Patch Kids. The Rubik's Cube was perhaps the definitive fad of the 80s. Created by Hungarian architect and design teacher Erno Rubik, the hand-sized block requires users to rotate the colored movable pieces of a cube until each side is the exact same color. Easier said than done, unless you're this guy. The toy was originally marketed to adults. In fact, the product launch was hosted by none other than Hungarian celebrity Zsa, Zsa Gabor. But the Rubik's Cube really took off as a children's toy, probably because kids had the time and patience to solve it. Following its success, officially sanctioned Rubik's spin-offs like Rubik's Race and Rubik's Revenge flooded the market. Bantam Books' biggest bestseller of 1981 was The Simple Solution to Rubik's Cube, which was purchased by over 7 million people who simply couldn't get the colors to line up on their own. You're watching the most exciting game you will ever see on your TV set. For years, consumers could buy an electronic gaming device that hooked into a TV and allowed them to play games like Pong. But the launch of the Atari VCS, or Atari Video Computer System, popularized the notion of games on interchangeable cartridges, promising players an array of choices. This Atari video game system launched in 1977 and slowly grew in popularity. It was a white-hot commodity around Christmas time in 1979 and sold a million units, all while competing with upstarts like the Intellivision and the Odyssey. Atari dominated the video game market throughout the early 80s. In fact, the console had made its way into 4 million more homes in 1982 alone. The folks at Mego Toys must be kicking themselves. In 1977, they turned down the chance to manufacture and distribute toys based around a small science fiction movie with a cast of unknowns. Instead, their rival Kenner took the deal. Yes, that movie was Star Wars, which became a much more massive hit than anyone could have imagined. That year, millions of kids wanted nothing more than to find Princess Leia, Chewbacca, R2-D2, and Luke Skywalker under their Christmas tree. Unfortunately, Kenner didn't have enough time to make their Star Wars toys, so they didn't. To pacify fans, the company sold an item called the Early Bird Certificate Package, a shoebox-sized cardboard stand that featured images of Star Wars figures and a mail-in certificate that was good for four action figures that would supposedly be shipped in a few months. They're the Star Wars Early Bird set of figures. These action figures are not yet available, but this Star Wars Early Bird Certificate Package is in stores. Unfortunately, a lot of stores sold out of the Early Bird Certificate Package, too. In other words, in Christmas 77, countless parents gave their kids the promise that they'd receive their toys sometime in the spring or summer. Star Wars action figures did eventually make it into stores in 1978, and Kenner ultimately sold $100 million worth of what was initially a line of 12 figures. Kids can be a rambunctious bunch, particularly on Christmas morning. How many children were heartbroken after Santa's stop-in because they immediately broke all their brand new toys? That wasn't a problem on December 25, 1976, when Stretch Armstrong was the most popular toy. Stretch Armstrong was a latex doll made to look like a blonde guy in trunks with a condensed corn syrup center which explains his considerable stretching capabilities. Armstrong's arms, legs, and torso could be pulled, bent, and tied in knots according to taste. At his longest, Mr. Armstrong could be extended to four feet long. How'd he do that? He's been doing that since he was a kid! Kenner ultimately sold $50 million worth of the $11 doll. 
Now seen as the ultimate example of a dumb fad, the pet rock didn't really do anything. It was literally just a rock in a box. Advertising executive Gary Dahl took small stones from a Mexican beach and nestled them on beds of hay in tiny cardboard boxes that had holes cut out, presumably so that the rocks could breathe and enjoy a decent quality of life. The pet rock sold well throughout 1975, making for an ideal Christmas gift that year. By the time the fad died out, approximately 1.5 million pet rocks had found their forever homes. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.